G'day and welcome to Scrounder's Workshop. Today I'm working on a two and a half inch record vice made in England. Good quality vice, especially these old ones. You may notice the zero on the side of it. Unfortunately, record have a really weird way of numbering their vices. Most companies will write the size of the vice on the side, two inch, two and a half inch, three inch, except record. Zero means it's a two and a half inch. A one means it's three inch, a two means it's three and a half inch. Really archaic, but hey, that's how they do it. Anyway, let's get on with tearing this thing down and having a good look at it. You may have noticed this video is a lot longer than my normal videos of five or six minutes. That's because a friend of my channel, Ben, over there in England, Tool Attic Ben, got a great channel and I really recommend you check it out. He's asked me to do a more detailed video of how I restore my vices. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I collect two and a half inch vices from everywhere. And this is the 11th one I have, and this is my eighth restoration. Uh, so far I'm very happy with this. And I'm also give you some tips for people that are just starting out in restoration on how you can save some money. So the first bit of advice I'd give you is when you're removing screws like these, these old ones, take your time and make sure you clean out the grooves properly. I can tell straight away these are not going to come out without some help and all I'll do if I keep trying is take the end off the screwdriver or ruin the slots. So your best friend in this case is heat. Get it good and hot. I'm showing this in real time so you can see. I'm just using a simple burns o uh, map gas heater here. Mine's actually connected to LPG, it's not as hot as the map gas, but it does the job pretty well. As you can see, I spend plenty of time getting that heat in. That's cast iron in there. It takes a lot of heat to get those screws to come loose. So my first money saving tip I'm going to give you is where you can buy second hand equipment. Good quality second hand equipment will save you a fortune. I use a lot of stuff, I've got a lot of gear but I've collected it over 30 years and it's going to get very repetitive but I'm going to tell you everything you see in this video that I have purchased second hand and try and tell you how much money I saved when I did it. As an example, the first piece the vice I'm using to hold the workpiece while I heat it, it's a Dawn cast steel offset engineer's vice. I paid $300 for it, replacement is around $800, quite a saving. Now as you can see, the heat's done its job and it's really released that screw quite easily. I should be wearing gloves here, anytime I'm using heat, wear gloves, or like me, you'll end up with no fingerprints. I always forget how hot things are. Uh, first tool you should get, an impact driver indispensable when you're working with old stuff, old screws, old nuts, old bolts. You belt it like that and it jars the screw loose and generally they'll come out, especially with some heat. So here's a look at the impact driver. As you can see, I've got a couple of them. You can never have too many. Nice and thick to get your hands around. Righty tighty, lefty loosey, so you can tighten and loosen with them. And these are the tips, especially hardened tips. But even then, they might not do the job and you'll end up busting the tips. And these are designed to be belted on quite hard. One of the things I've learnt with vices is I won't buy one if this top slide has been damaged, if someone's used it as an anvil. It's too hard to get the marks out of it. Uh, the way I sand them and polish them, they need to be in good condition. See if you can figure out what that hole's for. I'll tell you at the end of the video. Otherwise it's in pretty good nick. Um, just having a look over it, just seeing what's going to need repairing. 
what I can leave. Again, this is good. Record castings are quite good compared to a lot of the others. They're, they're really good. They know this stuff and they cast well. Here I'm working out what's going to be high polished on this vise. Uh, nice and bright. Uh, most of my vices follow a similar format now, but I quite like it. And uh, gives them a nice finish. So I'm also assessing what's going to need repairing and how much work. Uh, the back of this fixed jaw, you can see it's not straight. That'll get straightened out. And it's really important to keep all your parts together in one container so you don't lose anything. So now let's get this thing in the sandblaster, which I bought second hand. And the dust extractor here, I bought that second hand as well, and the compressor. And I've modified the dust extractor with the big air cleaners. Those that are interested, I'm running a garnet grit, 30 to 60 sharp grade, and I'm running it at about 110 psi. All the junk you see in the background are pieces that I want to sandblast eventually, but I'm in no hurry for them. So they'll just sit in there and get hit with overspray if you like, and it gradually sandblasts them. If you're looking to get into sandblasting equipment, you're looking at some serious investment in money. Uh, you're looking at several thousand dollars for a decent setup. You do need a large capacity compressor. Those piss fart Chinese direct drive things, they just won't cut it. They won't keep up with the air delivery and they won't live long enough. They're not designed to run all the time. You can hear my compressor running in the background all the time, but it doesn't do it any harm and it keeps up with the airflow. You need a good dust extraction system and you need a decent sized well made cabinet. I got all mine second hand so all, all up it, the whole thing cost me less than a thousand dollars. But you're looking at four or five times that if you want everything new. Once you've got it however, it's cheap to run. You just need to upgrade your media every so often. Otherwise, there's no expenses except the electricity. So there's a lot of advantages to sandblasting once you've made the investment. It's very satisfying to do watching that metal come up. It comes up in a nice matte finish like that. It's ready for paint or powder coat and it will get into all those nooks and crannies that nothing else can. Just very enjoyable to do.
Okay, pop quiz. This cast iron beetle, I've called him Alexander. But do you know what he's for? Leave a comment if you think you know. I'll show you the answer at the end. Here's a hint. He's got to take a lot of weight on his back. Here's the compressor I use just for sandblasting. As you can see, it's a triple cylinder unit made by Macmillan in Brisbane, Australia, and I paid $100 for it. Complete bargain, it does the job so easy. Now the real condition of this vice is revealed. I'm really happy with it. You can see the boys that are grind these down only get a few seconds on, on each vice, so they do enough that needs doing. Looks rough, but it's actually pretty damn good. Look at that zero, that's actually so perfect. That's great, happy with that. Uh, these areas here will all need work, of course. Um, but there's nothing bad. That, that hole's been machined. But this has had a very easy life, this vice. It hasn't been abused. Look at the quality of that casting in there, those letters. There's a few nicks there. A little bit of cleaning up to do, to do that I'll point out, but uh, those letters are perfectly cast. And a lot of ices they're not, and they take a lot of time to fix up. Here, a bit of flashing to clean up, no big deal. And for those of you that don't know, when they cast a vice, it's a two-piece mold put together, so you get this flashing right down the middle of the vice. Again, the only fault here is a tiny bit in that G. Really pleased with it. You can see here the rough grinding around the edges. There's another mould line down the front showing how the two halves are put together. And then the molten cast iron is poured in. But they certainly don't get much time to grind them. They're a utilitarian tool. They're designed to do a job. They're not all fancy like some of the saws and planes that you see. Look how snug that fits. Beautiful. Record really do. Their old tools are really good quality. Again here with this screw. Great condition. A few little nicks and marks that I'll have to get out if I'm going to polish this. Um, another one there. Somebody missed with their hacksaw just here, but the screw's in very good condition and it was bone dry, there wasn't a drop of oil on it. So it just goes to show that this thing was hardly used. Again, these jaws are uh, a bit hacked up, but the sandblast has cleaned them up pretty well. And again, like I said, I've got a little, little trick to make these look a lot better. So my favorite tool, the first tool I start with, and we'll get into it now, is a flat disc. So again, if you're starting out, get yourself a good second-hand grinder or a new one, just get a little four-inch grinder, use flat disc. Try not to ever go at a rest restoration with a grinding disc. You'll put grooves and marks in it that are just so hard to get out. Flat discs are flexible. They don't take too much off. As you can see, does the job. Gives it a polish and a sand at the same time. Oh, and that grinder is a Makita 5 inch. I got it brand new back in the 1980s as a birthday present. Still going strong. Buy quality tools. Those thick leather work protectors that go in the jaws of the vise. Yeah, a couple of old boots that were going in the bin. Best thing ever. And free. As you can see here, I keep the disc moving. Try not to stop in one spot. You'll get a flat spot or you'll get grooves and notches in your work. And then you've got even more work to fix.
This is another piece of kit I really like. It's a four inch wide belt sander, uh, made here in Australia. Current price is about $440 for it. That's without the grinder it's attached to. I paid $100 for it off eBay. The bench grinder I'm driving it with, I found in a skip. So I brought it home, pulled it apart and found a seized bearing. Cost me $21 for two new bearings. It's an eight inch, one horsepower, 750 watt unit. Cost me almost nothing. Down in the right hand corner, you can just see the white edge of a piece of ductwork. That's connected to my big extractor system next to the sandblaster. Watch the way it sucks up the stuff coming off this belt. Really makes a difference. But even so, I still wear a respirator. Got to look after your lungs. Back on my bench I have this aluminium pot full of water to cool down those things I've been heating. Quite often that's my fingers. I've got half a dozen grinders but I keep the two I use the most right above where I'm working. Makes it very convenient. And files, you've got to have files. Files are dirt cheap to buy second hand. People would only charge you a dollar or two normally. And as long as they're sharp they're great. They're really good for reshaping. I've got about two hours filing work in this restoration. The machines are really good for doing the heavy lifting, but you need to get into those corners and nooks and crannies, and the files are really good for that. Start off with a heavy coarse one like I'm using here, then I'll move on to the finer files. Good for that mild reshaping, um, and once I've finished the filing, I can take it over to my final polishing machine. Uh, comes up ready for paint. That ridge across the back of the vise that I'm working on now, when you're filing or cutting it with the grinder in your vise, a lot of junk slides down that face. And that ridge there is to deflect that junk from contaminating the main screw area. Clever design. This ridge I'm working on now is the same as the other ridge you saw before, only bigger. It's to stop junk sliding down the back of the vise and landing on that machine top face of the sliding jaw. When you go to undo the jaws, stuff on there can really score that top face.
Here's an odd thing I found about file and cast iron. When you first start, it feels quite hard. It feels almost like hard and steel. And it feels quite tough to get through. But then once you break through that top layer, it becomes quite soft. It's quite nice to file, almost like brass. Maybe someone can explain why. I've now switched to a round file, which is called a rat tail file. Again, like the grinder, it's important to keep the file moving around. I don't hold it in one place. I'm not trying to dig a new groove into the base of the vise. What I'm trying to do is remove the flashing and the heavy grind marks. Once I've finished with this coarse file, I'll use a, a bigger, smoother rat tail file, get in there and do some polishing, and then I'll use some sandpaper, and I'll show you that coming up. Now these are a handy little kit, pretty cheap off eBay, maybe 20 bucks. Uh, they're great for getting into those tight areas again. I'll show you what I mean here. So you just slip one of these sanding drums over the main rubber drum, like that. Then when you screw up the nut it's a left hand thread that puts pressure on the rubber to expand holds the drum in place and then you can be into it This is what the area was like when we started and this is what it's like now we finish pretty well ready for paint so all that flashing and heavy grinding marks they're all gone those fine scratches you won't see when it's finished so now I'm getting down to the nitty-gritty of preparation for paint this is another second-hand grinder that I bought and I've been using these nylon pads for about three years and they've been a game-changer for me they save a lot of manual sanding and wire brushing etc they're just awesome the only downside to these pads is they make a hell of a mess so i've mounted mine on one of the doors to my workshop so i can swing the door open move the machine over to the right and everything just gets shot straight out the door and not all around my garage uh, once it's finished on this machine it's ready for paint or to go over to the buffer for the final high shine polishing Now into the parts I want brightly polished. My wife bought me this buffing machine as a present. Uh, all the mops and the rouges and everything I bought brand new. So the buffing pads I'm using are tightly woven cotton. The one on the right here gets the rouge. The one on the left, just a plain 
buffing wheel, no rouge or anything on it. Uh, and I tend to use the green rouge and it works for me. I get a, a reasonably good result and so I don't bother changing. I've got other pads, but I just don't use them. Something to note about cast iron, I found it won't take a high mirror polish like carbon steel will. Don't know why, I don't know if it's the imperfections or the grain structure of the metal, but I'll show you in a minute what I mean. So now I've finished polishing all the high shine parts. I give everything a good wash down with the wire brush and acetone. Actually do this twice. Make sure I get all that uh, buffing rouge off there or the paint won't stick. Have you figured out what that hole's for yet? Now the masking. That must mean we're getting towards the end. Yeeha. I've got about 50 cans of pressure packed paints and I get sick of shaking them so I built this machine to do it for me. Today I'm using a dark Ford blue. I can't get round or blue in Australia. You can get it in England alright which is the original colour for the record tools. But anyway this will have to do. I've designed this machine to take the three different size cans that I use and I've also designed it to be used with or without the caps. So let's see how it works. Well, 
one of the things I like about this machine is I can set and forget. I've used an old microwave timer to set the time and turn it on and off. So I can just switch it on, walk away and leave it. Come back when the bell rings. I really like this paint. Being engine enamel, I don't need a primer. It flows nice and thick straight out of the cam without runs. Dries very fast and I'm really happy with the colour. To protect the bright polished parts from corrosion, I use the cheapest paste wax I could find at the local auto parts store. Smear it on good and thick. Give it about 10 or 15 minutes to dry and then just buff it off again. Works great. Last chance to figure out what that hole is for. Here's the advantage of polishing all those parts before painting. I just hit all the letters now with some acetone. Hey presto, it's all polished already. I've also found out that this zero vice isn't record smallest vice. They actually make a double zero, which is a two and a quarter inch vice. Why do they make a two and a quarter inch vice and a two and a half inch vice? Who knows? But I'll certainly grab it if ever I get the chance to find one. Here's the jaws after they've been cleaned. Being hard and steel, there's not a lot I can do to fix them. But like I said, I've got a little trick. Look at the bottom, like brand new. You might see here the difference between highly polished carbon steel or hard and hardened steel and cast iron. I'll give you a closer look. So can you see the difference now between the cast iron on the left and the carbon steel on the right? Really see the difference in the shine. So for those of you that are still with me and haven't died from sheer boredom yet, this restoration's finished. Here's a quick look at what we started with. And I'm gonna be curious to see if anyone worked out what that hole was for and what Alexander Beetle was for. Now in total, I've got about 10 or 11 hours in this restoration. Uh, it's a fair bit of work, but I really enjoy it. I enjoy the finished product. Here it is all finished and I'm very happy with the way it turned out. It's a credit to Records Engineering. 
Sorry Ben, I didn't get to show all my vices this time, but I will do another video showing all 11 of my miniature vices. Hope you can watch that too. Now as for that little hole, another piece of clever engineering but simple from record, is to get oil on that main screw. And Alexander Beetle, what's he for? Again, simple. Hope you enjoyed the video. Bye.